Good morning, good morning, Rabotai. Breakfast in the class today is dedicated for the Rufuah Shalema of Bahia Ribka Abat Esther by her grandchildren, Gail and Sonny Haddad. As well, uh, breakfast is donated uh, in loving memory of Mo Malali Lui Nishmat, Moshe, Moshe Ben Jamile, uh, sponsored by his son, Jack Male. Azaku Baruch. Rabotai, our parasha opens with two words, two words that I think are very beautiful and I think often uh, that are not appreciated enough. And I think in some ways we, we will talk about this idea in some different iterations uh, during the course of this week. The parasha begins and says, Vayishma Yitro and Yitro heard, all right, and, and he came to join the Jewish people. Vayishma Yitro and Rashi asks famously, what did he hear that made him decide to come and join the Jewish people? And Rashi brings down, actually, different opinions in the Midrash. Rashi brings them down together. He says he heard about Kriyat Yamsuf Umilchemet Amalek. He heard about the splitting of the sea, and he heard about the war with Amalek. And that made him decide to come to, uh, to join the Jewish people. Rabotai, I think that Rashi is asking a great question and making an amazing point. But I think in some ways, at least for us in our generation, Rashi's point is not the point. Allow me to explain for one minute. Rashi is very concerned about what he heard that made him come. And I think perhaps for our generation, the question is not what did he hear? The important point, the impressive point, is not what he heard, but that he heard. Now, what I mean by this, Rabotai, I want to explain uh, by way of an example. You know, there's a, a fellow who moves from America or from wherever, Chutzlaretz, he moves to Israel. He says, back in the day where when you moved from Israel, you, when you moved to Israel, or when you went to visit Israel, you know, the first place you went was not Ben Yehuda. You know, you didn't go to eat out in this or that fancy restaurant. You know, I remember back when I was a kid, you know, we used to go sometimes straight from the airport directly to the kota with the luggage in the car. And then we, they would wait in the car, we'd run to the kota like... There were different things that we were running to visit when we went to Israel. I know there's people here sitting in the crowd today who love Israel so much that they want to move there. I don't think they want to move there for the falafel. <laughs> you want to move to be in Arsenu HaKedoshah, to be there, to you see everyone walking with their tefillin in the street, with their, you know, the, the, the streets of Jerusalem are quiet on Shabbat, you know. So people moved for different reasons. Anyway, one guy, he makes the move, and he gets to Israel, and he's overjoyed. Shabbat morning, there's no cars on the streets. He's not a religious guy. He come, comes out of his house. He walks down the street. There's no job. You know, the, the, all the stores are closed. There's no buses. He walks with his coffee down the street. And he sees this beautiful fig tree. Anyway, he's not living anymore in Manhattan. So someone had to explain to him what a tree was. But after he understood <laughs> what it was, he climbs up into the branches of this fig tree and he luxuriously leans back and he's sitting there eating the fruits of Eretz Israel right off the branch uh, on the tree. Anyway, some guy wrapped up in a talit, you know, is, I, that always amazed me, by the way. You see guys in Israel walking with a talit, okay, fine, memela. But you see people walking in the, in the heat, in the scorching sun of in Jerusalem sun, and they have the talit over their head. You know, that's a level I don't understand, you know. I, I realize that that's how taletot go yellow. Either way, so how does, the, he sees the guy, with, you know, wrapped up in the talet, gift wrapped, I call it, right? You see guys, you know, I call that gift wrapped. You, you know, for HaKadosh Baruch the guy's gift wrapped in his talet. He walks up to him and he sees this guy <laughs> sitting in a tree with a coffee, eating figs off the tree. He goes, no! Shabbos! Shabbos! You're not allowed to climb on a tree on Shabbos. You're not allowed to pick fruit off the tree on Shabbos. Loi sigzoil. You're not allowed to steal from the owner of the tree. You didn't ask permission. And did you check the fig for worms? 
guy takes another fig off the tree. He doesn't break a sweat. He pops it in his mouth. He eats it. He goes, ah, I'm Mechaya. I don't know how, there's no good way to translate that into Sefaradi. I don't know how to translate I'm Mechaya. You know, he's like, wow, amazing, fantastic, he says. He goes, the fruit of Eretz Israel and a Dvar Torah. <laughs> <laughs> right? You know, you're looking at this. <laughs> you know, in Hebrew, the translation is so beautiful. He says, Gam lehenot mi perot ha'aretz, the gam lishmoa divre Torah. Like, you know, the guy is throwing all these things at him. And he's, you know, and he, the guy, nothing penetrated. He didn't hear what the guy said. He heard about a lot of Jewish words. He heard the guy tell him it was Shabbat. He heard it. But it wasn't, it didn't, it didn't perturb him. It wasn't, that's not where he was. Rabotai. Vayishma Yitro means that a person can hear a lot of things. Right? And, and, and not understand that those words are directed at, that they're meant for him. You know, sometimes people come to ask me questions and they think that they're very clever. And they tell me, Rabbi, I have a friend that... <laughs> right? And sometimes it's so plain to see that the question they're asking is not about a friend. It's about themselves. But they like putting it on their friend because, right? So there was once a rabbi who was very sharp. His name was Rabbi David of Lelov. So a guy came to him and he says, you know, I have a friend and he, uh, what's it called? And he, uh, uh, he has this big question about if something is right or wrong to do and this and that and the other, you know. And Rav David of Lelov says to him, he says, he says, it's a great question. Tell your friend to come see me. <laughs> right? Right? Now, so sometimes people tell you, you know, it's, it's, but sometimes rabbis employ the same trick that congregants try to employ on their rabbis. They go to a guy who needs to hear Musar, and they say to him, you know, there's a guy I know in the community, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to decide how to communicate this message to him. <laughs> he needs to do this, he needs to do who they're trying to talk to, obviously the guy. But the guy wouldn't, he don't hear nothing, because it doesn't penetrate the guy doesn't want to hear that that is, that that is him. That that is something that he needs to change. Rabotai, there's something incredibly powerful about these two words. Vayishma Yitro, that Yitro heard. Rashi is already bothered with, dealing with what it is that he heard. But I think it's amazing that he heard, and let me tell you why. You know, I... I uh, <laughs> I never forget when I go to a restaurant and I'm sitting at the restaurant and you have a non-Jewish waiter come up to you you have a pizza sitting there on the thing you're about to start eating and the non-Jewish waiter says to you um, the pizza's hamotzi <laughs> I think you need to wash for that I'm like, you know, you're a rabbi you spent all this time in yeshiva you know, you learn all the laws of pizza you know, you never thought there were laws for pizza there are laws, you know, what's in the dough what's not in the dough kove asuda, not kove asuda right, and this is a non-Jewish guy he's telling you, you have to wash your hands you have to for the pizza you know, I'm a rabbi I don't, I don't, I don't need to hear, you know I don't need to hear your halachic shiur as to what the beracha is <laughs> On, on the pizza. So you feel like you're above it. I was in bagels and I always tell you guys this. And I overheard another conversation with someone while I'm eating my egg bagel. Egg bagel, everybody knows, is mizonot. And anyway, the guy's telling this, he's a Jewish owner over there. He tells the guy, he goes, the bagel's a mizonot. He goes, no, no, I'm getting the egg bagel. I was like, you tell him. <laughs> the guy says, what egg bagel? He goes, our egg bagels have no eggs in them. They're yellow because we use food coloring. <laughs> The, uh, the bagels from Bagels and Co. Ahamutzi, with the exception, <laughs> I'm sorry, this is a public service announcement, right? Besides, with the exception of maybe cinnamon and raisin, where they have like a blueberry ba- bagel as well. So it's actually cinnamony, it's sweet, it has raisins, it has fruit in it. But other than that, they're all Hamutzi. So you're sitting there, you think you're a know it all, but you don't know nothing, right? You, you aren't willing to listen because you know more than the waiter, because you know more than the other guy. Think for one second who this person is who's listening. We have standing over here in the back two people who are uh, EMTs, correct? Is that the correct terminology? Emergency medical technicians. How many times has it happened where you gave a patient or handed a patient over to a doctor that didn't want to hear what you had to say? Because you're only an EMT. I went to medical school. 
almost always, are you starting to hear now, Rabotai, pardon the pun, what is so special about the words Vayishma Yitro? Yitro is an expert in his field. He's the Archbishop of the world. He was the expert in all religions. He was the rabbi of the rabbis. He was the Gadol Ador, just for the wrong, <laughs> right? He was the PhD. He had nothing to learn from anybody. And then he hears a story about a ragtag group of people, about a people that are not wealthy and that are not important and that are not educated. They're a bunch of slaves and they are freed. And this is the story of their life. And Yitro's response to hearing about those people was to think, you know what? Maybe my best recourse is to join them, is to be one of them. Fascinating. Vayishma Yitro. And Yitro heard. I want to ask you right now, if you are willing, are able, are prepared to be open enough to listen to people that you consider lesser than yourself. Rabotai, lesser than yourself is not just a rabbi and a non-Jewish waiter regarding the laws of Berachot. It's not just a doctor and an EMT, a doctor and a nurse. How many times have I heard people who are nurses tell me that they have sat at the bedside of a patient that died because the doctor was too arrogant to listen to what the nurse had to say. The doctor makes a diagnosis based on his study. He's doing his best. Triage, under the circumstance. But the nurse is trying to communicate, but that's not what I'm seeing in the patient. Terrible. But it's not just experts. It's lesser than or bigger than in the subject at hand. When you're not willing to listen to your wife, when she tells you uh, about directions, <laughs> I know where I'm going, honey. I know where I'm going as I'm an expert. Your wife asks you if this is a good investment. No, I'm just throwing my money away. The passive aggressive response. No, I didn't speak to anybody. I'm guilty of it. No, I didn't speak to any. No, yeah, probably it's a stupid thing. You're an expert now? You Warren Buffett had that? What, what are you, what? You're shorting GameStop? What are you doing now? <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing? Right? What are you doing? This ability that a person has to humble themselves and just listen. Never mind what you're listening to. To be a person that is open to learning from people to never thinking that they always know better about any given subject. That is a remarkable thing. And it strikes me that we are taught that this parasha is named after Yitro. And why is it named after Yitro? Our rabbis tell us because he sees what's going on with all the Jewish people and everyone's lined up and Moshe Rabbeinu was answering questions from the morning until the evening, right? And, and the system... Yitro comes and knocks on the tent of his son-in-law, Moshe Rabbeinu. <laughs> I don't know if everyone is here is married, but this is the ultimate. You're the rabbi of all the Jewish people. Had that got here yesterday on the 304 train. Right? He's like, I know that you're the rabbi and the leader and the prophet, but this whole system is wrong. <laughs> Really, what you need to do is set up judges. How do you have the suggestion box on the first day? Right? Is that your father-in-law duties? Like, you know, to come and correct me, to tell me that I'm running, that I'm running this wrong? Do you know, I don't know if you read about me in the newspapers. I took the Jews out of Egypt, by the way. You know, I turned the, the waters to blood and listened to frogs. You don't know what I could do to you, my father-in-law, with this staff. Right? But Yitro is not interested. And we changed the name of the parasha to Yitro. And it's a shocking thing, that, to me. Because if you were to choose one parasha in the Torah that was the most important parasha in the Torah, it's got to be this one. It's the one where God gives the Torah. Each parasha is named for an auspicious event, for something that we learn in the parasha, which dominates the rest of the stories, so to speak, in the parasha. 
and we're supposed to learn from the name of the parasha something which kind of helps us understand everything which is in that vessel, uh, that chapter, that story. How do you go and give away the name? How do you give away the name to that parasha, to this Yitro, this Johnny come lately? You know why? Because he had a suggestion. This synagogue is called the Edmund J. Safra Synagogue. Yeah, if we put some names on the wall, that makes sense. But you imagine someone comes along and says to me, Rabbi, you know, the 7.30 Shaharit and the 6.30 Shaharit, it's not such a good idea. Because 6.30, you know, the Minyan only ends at, you know, sometimes 7.20, 7.25. That means that it's too close. You have the 6.30 Minyan, has to be downstairs, 7.30. But now with COVID, really, the Minyanim should be 6.30 and 7.45. That way, both Minyanim could pray in the main sanctuary. Imagine someone comes and tells you, gives you advice like this. New guy. Oh, I say, I have to make a phone call. Hello, Mrs. Safra? Yes. We're thinking of taking your husband's name off the building. Yes. Yes. Oh, no. It's not for a donation. It's not for someone else. It's not. No, it's just because a guy came and he gave me a suggestion about changing the 730 Minyan to 745. No, he's never been here before. No, no, he's not. He's not Jewish. But I just figured, you know, he made a good suggestion. We should give him the name. We should give him the name and the keys to the building. This is the parasha of the Torah. The name of the parasha should be called Sinai. It should be called Luchot. It should be called Torah. It should be called, I don't know, Nazev and Ishma. Something. You're going to call Yitro because some rando came in and gave a suggestion? The answer is Rabotai that there's something incredibly powerful about the naive way in which Yitro comes to give the suggestion to his father-in-law. Some people come in and give you suggestions how to run your shul, how to run your marriage. Every young, newly married guy will tell you that nobody he meets who's married or divorced will pass up the opportunity to tell him how to run their marriage. How does new man newly married, right? Every, you meet the guy, you don't know who you are, you're like, yes, you should treat her very nicely. You should do this. You know, never go to bed angry. I always do that. Give you all the pieces of wisdom <laughs> that either worked for them or didn't work for them. Right? They give you everything. They just want to unload. Right? So some people give advice because they want to feel good about themselves. But Yitro gave advice that he knew had the potential to be ill-received. It's his own son-in-law. He's just got, he hasn't learned anything. It's brand new. He doesn't know any Torah. Maybe there's, a re- Maybe there's a law that obligates Moshe to t- answer every question personally. Did you learn the laws yet? You don't even know Aleph bit. Yitro was a truth seeker. When he saw something that was wrong, he, he couldn't let it lie. So he had to say something. He had to do something. We call the parasha Yitro because the prerequisite Without the story, understanding the lesson of Yitro, there is no Torah. You know what the most important thing for the Jewish people when they received the Torah was? God makes a sound and light show. There's, there's fire and there's lightning and there's smoke and there's thunder and there's shofars. I just imagine some sort of uh, you know, celestial, you know, uh, 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 person with the, you know, the sticks. You know, he raises the shofar, they're blowing the chatzot zerot. You know, he's literally... De- but then at the moment when God says, Anochi Hashem Elokecha, the whole world goes silent. A bird doesn't chirp. Nobody says anything. In the moment that God says, Anochi Hashem Elokecha. You know why? Because even the smallest sound might have distracted someone from fully listening to the words Anochi Hashem Elokecha. I saw in this Rabotai the most profound truth. You could be hearing literally, literally, and I don't use literally in the way that the kids use it today. Today, the word literally, literally means (laughs) non-literally. Rabbi, I was literally dead. No, no. No, no, no. <laughs> you were 
figuratively. <laughs> right? So I use the word literally. You could be hearing the literal gospel truth from God Himself. But if there's another noise, if there's a bird that chirps while God says, Anochi Hashem in Lokecha, you might not have heard it properly. Listening requires undivided attention. And today, it's almost impossible to listen, to hear, to hear somebody else. I've said many times before that when it comes to emet, the challenge is that we, as human beings, we are extremists. One person stands at Aleph, at one side of the Aleph bed, and says, the emet is with me. Another person, the nature of emet itself is hidden in its word, stands at the letter Taf and says, no, no, the truth is with me. Opposite end of the Aleph bed. When really, where is the truth? Almost invariably, the final letter Mem, which is the exact middle, of the Aleph Bet. Almost always, the Emet lies between two polar opposites. Rabotai, even as a Republican, I must tell you, there are some ideas that the Democrats have that are right and we're wrong about. And if I was a Democrat, I would sit here and tell you that there are some things that the Republicans have which is right. It is right for a country to want to take care of its most vulnerable citizens. It is also right for a country to recognize that if all you're doing is taking care of your most vulnerable, you don't have with what to take care of your most vulnerable. This is the most obvious, the most obvious example. And yet everyone stands on their perch and yells. They stand on their soapbox, on their pedestal, and say that I have emet, emet is with me and you're wrong. I'm the righteous guy. I'm right. I'm right about where we send our kids to school. I'm right about which community we should be part of, honey. I'm right about how we should spend the money in the house. I'm right about which way to educate our kids. I'm right about whether we should go soft. You can't go soft on him. The kid's learning. He's learning to rebel. But maybe you're going too hard on him. We're always sure. The lesson of the Torah is that you don't have a Torah if you don't have a Vayishma Yitro, where what could be considered the expert theologian of the world is still willing to hear, maybe I've got it wrong. Maybe there's something that someone else has to teach me. And I'm fond of saying that if you look carefully at the words of Rashi, Rashi says he heard about Kiryat Emsuf. That's a good one. Huh. He must be real. The, guy, the dude can split seas. You know, he's amazing at that. Wow. He's the lord of the sea splitting. Fantastic. He heard about Kiryat Emsuf. But then, the second thing that he heard about, he heard about Milchemet Amalek, the war with Amalek. Why, why did that convince him that his other idols, that his other pagan gods were inferior? There was nothing miraculous per se about the war with Amalek. The Jews fought them. It wasn't a decisive victory. They're going back and forth and back and forth. That's how wars work. One side wins. W what about that war? It convinced Yitro to join the Jewish people, to convert. The answer is very powerful. It does not say that Yitro heard about Kiryat Yamsuf and Nitzachon Amalek, defeating Amalek. Truly, that would not be an extraordinary thing. It says he heard about Kiryat Yamsuf and Milchemet Amalek, the, the war of Amalek. What Yitro said is, I'm looking at these two events not as individual events, but I'm looking at these events juxtaposed one to the other. How could it be that the sea split? And our rabbis tell us that it wasn't just the waters of the ocean that split at that moment. It was all the waters in the world 
So if you had a river in your, you know, in your domain or in your region, it split. You had an ocean, it split. People around the world understood that at this very moment, the Jewish people are leaving Egypt and the ocean is splitting and they're escaping from their, from their captors. The God of the world is clearly on their side. How could it be that the immediate response to that miracle was for the Amalekites to attack the Jews? Yitro was not learning from the fact that the Jews were fighting against Amalek. He was not learning from the fact that the Jewish people won the war against Amalek. He was learning a deep human insight that it was possible for someone to witness a miracle open in front of their very eyes and to still go to war with the Jews. And if he could see that someone was incapable of seeing the messages and the signs that God was sending, that a person was capable of being deaf in this way, in this manner, Yitro asked himself, perhaps I have not been listening. I've checked out every religion except for one, the religion of my son-in-law, of Moshe Rabbeinu. Maybe the reason why I wasn't listening was because it's not so nice to have to admit when you're the expert that your Johnny-come-lately son-in-law actually had the truth before you did. You're on the cutting edge of truth-seeking. And this guy got there first? It's hard. Yitro was honest, and so he listened. And he listened, so he changed. Rabotai, we say all the time that change is hard. And I don't actually think that change is as hard as we think it is. I think change is hard because we don't listen. When someone tells you that if you drink this coffee, you're going to die, you're like, ah, come on, everyone drinks the coffee. Then someone says to you, no, no, in the first minyan, someone drank the coffee, and the EMTs, you see there's only one now, the other one. <laughs> he took the guy, they went to the hospital, Rahit, we just crossed him off the Tehillim list. <laughs> right? What do you do? You take the coffee, you put it down. You sure? This coffee you drank? From that machine? <laughs> right? If you really heard about the damages that making the wrong decisions bring to your life, if you really heard it, it would change you. If someone told you that this fruit was poisonous, don't eat this berry, poison, and you believed them, it wouldn't be hard to not eat that fruit. If someone told you, this guy has corona, and the guy's sitting in the corner, <coughs> he's coughing away. If you hear that, you're not gonna go stand next to the guy. You don't feel like, oh, you know what? I really want to talk to him. I'll talk to him later. I'll speak to you in two weeks, honey. Like, you know, it's not. The reason why we find it difficult to change is because we're not hearing. When someone says to us, you're hurting me. You're being insensitive. I feel hurt by your comments, by the way you're treating me. If I don't change, it's because I haven't heard. If you want to know the prerequisite to Torah, it is this. Aishma. Yitro. Never mind what he heard for a second. The beauty is that a person who is an expert can still deign to listen. May God bless us always to have giant ears. Have a great day.